and postponing this forum by a month, but it was for a good reason. And um, we'll go into that as we go forward here. So I'm gonna change our screens here and uh, change to another presentation. So what we intend to talk about today are coupled simulations of well and reservoir thermal hydraulics. Uh, the motivation um, for studying this work is that the intended design and long-term operations of the Ford Reservoir um, is, is currently planned to have, <coughs> excuse me, that's not COVID, it's uh, they're harvesting grain here in, in Idaho now, so allergies are running rampant. Um, so the motivation behind coupling and, and looking at this work is that we're looking at, you know, multi-stage um, perforated and, uh, and fractured zones within the injection well. And so the concern and the, the, the driver is to accurately represent and be able to, to apportion flow coming from a single injection well and have it correctly proportioned among the different perforation zones. And, and part of that, um, the, the physics of that would include not only dynamics of the reservoir, but also dynamics of frictional losses in the well, pressure drop and frictional losses through the perforation zones. And also um, pressure, uh, dynamics and pressure, uh, temporal pressure, or I'm sorry, temperature effects uh, in both. So that that's the motivator and driver for this. Um, so the, a group of us here, uh, myself and David Anders at the INL, Alida Finella at Golder, and Pranay Asai have been primarily working on this here for a little while. Um, we really don't even need to start working um, these things in, in earnest for, for months still. But we wanted to build this capability and test it um, rigorously before we needed to use it for Forge. So what I'm gonna show you here is a snapshot of a work in progress. Um, and there's still a few little bumps we're, we're working on, but uh, I'm pretty pleased so far with, with how the team and how the work's coming together. So the outline for today's talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about the forge wells and a completion philosophy. Um, I'm gonna also talk about the Moose project and platform. Um, it's not meant to be a sales pitch, but it's kind of, it, it sets the framework for how our codes interact here, um, first for all the continuum based codes um, that, we're, that we're using here um, at the INL and, and at the Moose team at large. Um, we're gonna talk about the codes themselves and the coupling methodologies. Uh, and then we're also going to go with some preliminary results and I'll close with some ongoing efforts. Um, I'll ask if, if you have questions or comments, you automatically come in muted um, to the meeting. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box. We'll try to get to them at the end. Um, and if you have um, suggestions or recommendations, send those along too. You can either email them to me personally or to the, I think it's modeling at utahforge.com or Utah Forge Modeling. Um, I, I forget what it is, but it, it's, it's on the, uh, on the webpage. So moving on from there. So, well, the first forge well name is in Kettleman coordinates of 16A 7832. That'll be the first full size, long reach, um, sub horizontal per, um, uh, test well at the forge site. So, what you're looking at here in this map, and I'm hoping you could see my pointer, is this cyan colored, cyan colored line or purplish line is the outline of the Utah forge site. If you recall when I was first starting to chat, um, before we launched the meeting off, there's a photograph on the cover on the landing page looking to the west. So there's the three well pads. This one here, that would be the one on the left side of the road, and that's the third. Um, the well pad for 16A is going to be uh, quite a bit to the west here at this location. Uh, the trajectory of the well is 105 degrees um, rotation. Um, looking at that in a cross section, uh, we're pointing on about a 4,000 foot horizontal offset along that trajectory. Um, so the well will come in and, and essentially uh, come into about 5,900 or 6,000 feet, begin its kickoff. Um, it's gonna build at five degrees per 100 feet um, measure depth as it makes its turn. And the, at the tangent section, we'll have an inclination of 65 degrees. Um, so all in the end, we have nearly 11,000 feet or so of, of is, is the current plan. Um, and, and the detail of the plan here is this is actually a work in progress. Um, it's evolving as we go and a lot of work has gone into this. Um, but I just wanted to quickly show some of the details um, for the well, how to be drilled and where it will be tested. Um, the long and short of this is it's a number, you know, a number of, of casing reductions are planned. Um, the overall plan is essentially for a liner hanger, a seven inch liner with a liner hanger um, to allow for some thermal expansion and thermal contraction. 
of some of the wellbores and some of the thermal effects. Um, there is also plans for some extended leak off tests after we come out of the build. And so in higher part of the reservoir, um, so up in, in this area here, um, and also so a more detailed testing after some core is collected from the very toe of the well, um, there'll be a short open hole section um, where we'll uh, be able to do some you know, defit tests and other um, injection tests and reservoir testing um, in that. And this is no longer a, um, a conceptual exercise. So this is a, the updated photo from not that long ago, within the last month, I believe. Um, same thing looking to the west as the original landing slide, but you can see now the road coming into to the forge site has been improved. It's been regraded and graveled. Uh, electrical power, here is power pole. So power has been ran to the site. This is the well pad for that 16A well. Um, and we're actually beginning right now, they're sitting in the cellars and beginning to uh, uh, prep to, to drill the well. So I think the current plan now has us having a full size, uh, uh, a triple neighbor's rig on site in about a month's time, give or take. So um, we're all strongly anticipating um, me as a, as, a, as a geologist by training, you know, seeing the drill bit spinning and turning um, uh, makes me very excited. And I'm sure many of you share my excitement here and with, with the prospects of what's gonna happen. So, but let's transition. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Moose project. And as I said earlier, this is not meant to be a sales pitch, but it's meant to just kind of get to the philosophy um, that I really haven't talked about too much in the modeling forums. Uh, but the philosophy behind the, the codes that we're using in the code development, um, all, all the, the continuum based codes, so the Falcon code and all the codes I'll talk about today primarily, they're all fully open sourced and available on, on the website, on INL's website. Um, we build you know, essentially a, a common framework called moose. And I've made this joke before that, you know, we're in Idaho and there's probably more wild animals than people in the state. So most all of our codes are named after some animal that's uh, native uh, to the area. So the reservoir code, falcon, fracturing and liquid convection, um, falcon, a peregrine falcon is a state bird of Idaho. That's where that came from. Um, another thing I want to point out that, you know, the, the moose base framework and even the physics based frameworks are essentially community driven. So you'll notice here, there's just a, a list of a small snippet of people that have contributed or, and are actively contributing to the code base, either some for some specific physics or for the actual numerical framework for the solvers themselves themselves. Um, you may notice that a number of the national labs are all part of this, say Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, Sandia, um, Livermore, uh, Lanel, uh, and a number of other collaborators here. So, um, so but and, and importantly, why we're actually using this code base um, to look at this problem in particular is because of the platform, it, it, it provides an object-oriented and pluggable system for defining all aspects of the simulation tool. So what I'm trying to show you here, essentially Moose, the framework, the solver framework sits here. Everything below this essentially is handled by um, the computer scientists and mathematicians um, either at INL or other places. Um, but me as a geologist or um, or anyone else that we use the code, if, if we need to understand our physics, the, the, all the new HPC stuff, the MPI, uh, the mesh partitioning, all gets handled for you um, by the framework, which makes it quite easy um, to, to actually develop codes here and get some pretty powerful capabilities without having to be uh, an applied mathematician or computer scientist. And so some of those general capabilities that we're relying on here that are essentially available um, uh, from the onset is, is that um, the code is inherently, all the codes are inherently one, two, or 3D because the physics that you write essentially are agnostic to dimension. Um, we don't have to factor in all that stuff. It's essentially handled by either LibMesh or somewhere as it's handled by Muse. Um, importantly too is that it is finite element based, but we have continuous and discontinuous um, solves. So um, it's a discontinuous Galerkin or actually even uh, reconstructed discontinuous Galerkin. So we can do shock capturing, you know, high velocity, high pickly number type fronts. Um, there is a lot of, you know, you'll see people discussing uh, fully coupled codes. I want to talk a little bit more about what, what coupled means and how, how you know, in, in, in more detail. Um, but I would say, you know, the codes that we're using here are fully coupled, fully implicit, um, but we have choices of how we couple them, whether they're tightly coupled, loosely coupled, or explicit. Um, any mesh style, structured or unstructured is easy. All these other things, I won't read into all those, but um, essentially, and stuff that you get here, which makes uh, building these coupled um, simulations um, uh, fairly robust and, and fairly straightforward. 
So what codes are we using here to, to look at, at, at the, uh, the well and reservoir flow? So um, for the pipe flow or flow in a well, um, we're using the thermal hydraulics module. Um, essentially what we're solving here is, is compressible Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and these are extracted from the Relap 7 code, which is a reactor design and leak um, type detection code using for designing reactors. Um, and for those of you who don't know that INL is uh, one of the, the DOE systems leading nuclear energy laboratories. So reactor design is one of our hallmarks here. Um, so we're actually able to leverage the thermal hydraulics module um, for use this, uh, for use in, in a forge. Um, and the reservoir code is, is, as I said earlier, Falcon code. Um, it's solving the Darcy equations for thermal, thermal hydraulic mechanics and, and chemistry. Um, and it pulls into a number of different modules within Moose. So porous flow, so anything that deals with a Darcy type equation is porous flow, tensor mechanics, um, geochemistry, so cat that's like a bunch of others, and I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, so what you're, what you're seeing here is, is, is actually snippets of, of what we're going to be discussing and solving on later. Um, so here on the, for the, for the, uh, the THM, um, what you're looking at here in blue, if you hopefully you can see my pointer, blue is the steel um, or of the steel of the well or the pipe. The gray is the well cement. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here is, is a radio axial symmetric radial simulation for a heat structure. And so the light green here is just surrounding um, granite or surrounding a rock uh, where the well bore is, is drilled. Um, here on the, on the Falcon or the, on the, uh, the Darcy simulation, you're looking at essentially this block here, the lower block as an upscale DFN, it's a, per, a porosity distribution of our native state model upscaled from the DFN and uh, above is simply is the sediment overburden above the site and this is the top of that model domain is essentially at the water table um, a couple hundred meters below ground surface. So the thermal hydraulics module, what does it do and how is it put together? So um, it's a, it's a common code base um, for thermal hydraulic applications based on moose. So, moose. so anything that anybody has a code that's trying to you know push flow through a a pipe essentially can can come into thermal hydraulics and, and you know and take advantage of those capabilities that are already made. Um, and, and what's nice about it is you can actually build the complexity and add into it, uh, just like stacking Lego blocks together. So um, the simplest approach is a single phase variable area, so the, the, the cross sectional area can change, can be deformed, uh, it's invisible and compressible flow. Um, for, for more challenging applications, we use a two-phase variable error system um, via the seven equation type model, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, so it can handle things like cavitation, bubble nucleation, boiling, um, and um, essentially flashing to steam um, all, all within the same code. And actually the two different phases are not essentially assumed to be an equilibrium. So you can have you know, disequilibrium between the phases. Now, once you get outside the pipe, you can have either 2D, either Cartesian or axisymmetric heat conduction and conjugate heat transfer. Uh, an important point here is new equations of state, and these equations of state can be used in any of the, of the moose based codes primarily. Um, Although some of them won't work very well for poor uh, things, but um, you know, of course, water, CO2, nitrogen, um, hydrogen, different like potassium or, or uh, sodium salts, etc. And these components, you know, essentially it's already pre-built and hardwired to to couple it into other moose-based codes, which is why we went here to begin with. Um, here's a validation example uh, of THM, and as I said earlier, it's based on the Relap 7 code, which is, um, you know, reactor system design piping, and Relap 7 also includes Neutronics, so it, um, it's, it's export controlled, and you need a clearance to actually get access to that code, so that's why we actually extracted THM and made it um, uh, something that's essentially is, is available to anyone. Um, Relap 7 itself is NQA1. If those are software jockeys or software coders, um, essentially would, would, would know that, that essentially national quality assessment. So it's essentially passed through the highest level of quality of certification um, uh, for these things. And I just wanted to show a simple example um, here to the right, comparing a pressure drop uh, for an analytical solution for the Darcy Weisbach equation shown in the on the orange dots versus the, the pressure drop prediction will take from a very small a, a one meter long pipe with uh, a 2.2 meter diameter flowing 10 kilograms per second through it with a with a wall roughness of about 5e e to minus 5 um, 
you see, it, you know, we, get, we had a really good match with uh, analytical solutions here um, across all these fluids and across all these pressure and flow ranges. Um, just shown here for some for uh, for clarity is, is that Darcy Weisbach equation, um, friction uh, friction your friction parameter, um, density of the fluid uh, velocity, and uh, the pipe diameter. Um, there, there is a number of, uh, of validation cases in, in the documentation um, for THM, mostly built to count comes from the Relapse 7. And if anyone's interested, I can share the, the Relapse 7 theory manual and, and, and uh, uh, theory manual or the user's guide with anyone if you want to see the full details of all those things. Uh, Falcon is where I spend most of my time. And, and Falcon, as I said, is our reservoir simulation code for specifically designed for EGS reservoirs. Um, I would also say that in the Moose framework, there's probably, because it is open source and uh, we host these things here, there's probably at least, I think, three or four other teams that have made geothermal type simulator codes based off of Moose. I know there's a group that made uh, some really, really powerful codes, and we can actually go to the Moose framework web page and see some of those. Um, but the Falcon itself, is, you know, it started out as, as a standalone code all written by myself and, and my team. Uh, but essentially has, has evolved quite a bit over the last few years where a lot of the physics that essentially now can be abstracted and put into a module where anybody can grab those modules then and use them. So all your Darcy type equations are in a porous flow module. Um, mechanics um, or in a tensor mechanics module. Now most of those are written by structural mechanicists, not geomechanicists. We have to do a little bit of work um, to, to, to make sure that works for us. And we want in the terms for um, uh, keeping our sign conventions, things uh, proper, but um, it, it's, it's manageable. Uh, geochemistry module is under current development right now. is really being beefed up by our colleagues um, at, at CSIRO actually in, in Australia. Um, and there's a number of supporting kernels, models, and workflows. Um, essentially, like the equation, of, the water equation of state, and the others, material properties, uh, constitutive relations, uh, certainly advanced time steppings, I/O. We also have an interface to pull um, information from FRACMAN and also other Earth model interfaces, such as like Leapfrog, Geothermal, or Petrel. So, um, importantly, because of the, the overall nature, we can simulate across all um, spatial and temporal scales pretty easily. And, and I would say all those um, modules are in various states of development, but all go undergo, before they become part of the Moose-based um, thing as a module, they have to go undergo rigorous testing and uh, validation before they're made available in the, um, on the essentially the public Git, um, however, the, 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 the stable branch of our Git repository. Uh, another point I want to point out is essentially, that, you know, this code from when we tested it, we could, uh, pretty much ideal scaling uh, up to over 10,000 processors. Um, and and you know, this is built on HPC type framework with, with that in mind. So, um, and, and we, we've tested um, simulations that are, you know, 30 million plus even more nodes. I think some other people have done even quite a bit larger than that, but in Falcon itself, we're at over 30 million um, grid cells with, with, with ease and with ideal scaling on our HPC resources. So coupling, I want to just briefly talk about this and I promise you I will get to the meat of, 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 the, of, the, of, of the Forge Reservoir here shortly. But um, because it's important to how these things hand data off and how things work together, um, I like talking about what coupling really means. So uh, at the horse's sense, you know, we could have loose coupling slash operator splitting. I think most people would call it just like a Picard type uh, handoff here, since we're one equation or one system. Um, can solve a piece and hand data off to the next. Uh, very simple, move on to the next time step. Um, tightly coupled, um, where you have multiple PDEs, say a flow and a transport. Um, this could be one, one simulation code or two codes working together. But essentially, you solve one PED, pass some data to the next PD, and, and iterate back and forth. I think that's the most common coupled thing with it inside a code or between codes. Um, how we solve things in Falcon and in the Moose framework by default is, is fully coupled. And I would say that essentially we have a, a global implicit scheme where all PDEs are solved simultaneously in one system um, using a Jacobian free uh, Newton Krylov uh, approach. So essentially we, we solve all those in one space. So what I'm showing here uh, is essentially this could be like this is how Falcon solves for, for flow and transport by default. It also can solve mechanics in the same way. Um, so all those PDEs are solved simultaneously. So if you have any uh, dependency in, say, you know, if a temperature term shows up in your, um, in anywhere in that system, it's solved and it's immediately always solved together. Now, when we're doing the coupling here between um, 
THM and Falcon. So both THM and Falcon are solved with this global implicit scheme. But when they do some of the handoffs, we have some of them are, are, are two-way and some of them are Picard, primarily for just doing some quick handoffs at a time steps, um, doing a very, uh, somewhat of a loose couple um, between the two codes. Uh, so let's let's kind of let's change gears now. So I, I, now we're going to get to what you probably really wanted to to, uh, to come here for. Um, let's let's do a standalone THM simulation. So basically, I wanted to show a parametric study of pipe dynamics, and, and what what the motivator for this was, and what actually caused this is what caused a delay in, in pushing off the uh, uh, this this form by a month was that a number of us were participating in the, in the Pivot 2020, the connections between oil gas and geothermal. And some of the comments and discussion came up for the size of a well needed to, for, for geothermal reservoirs had to be quite large or larger than what would be essentially considered appropriate in, or needed for oil and gas. And that caused myself and actually and John McLennan to have a little discussion and which drove us to do this, want to be able to present this um, parametric study um, before we talked about the coupling. So what we did was we actually simulated anywhere from between 20 and 160 kilogram per second flowing into what would be well 16A. Um, we used in a range of inside pipe diameters from 0.1 to 0.3 meters. That's a four inch to 12 inch pipe. And we did that in two inch increments. So, and, and the flow were in 20 kilogram per second increments. Um, and once again, what we had here was, um, such we, we, we had the pipe, the steel, the well, we had uh, two inches of concrete, and we had essentially a 10 meter radius outward of rock. So that's essentially what we have here. It does not include any reservoir dynamics, essentially, and we just approximated the, 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 hydro, the thermal gradient and the um, hydraulic gradients at the site to do this. And so uh, basically what we're looking at here for the THM design, um, here's the, is the same 16A plan that I showed earlier. And then blue here, just it's, it's, it's just offset just to show the same, that it's the same scale, is you have a, a, a vertical pipe coming down to midway point between the build, a, a junction of the pipe, and then the horizontal run. And, and most of the things that we're looking at here is, is and well be for comparisons primarily, or is the, the pressure out versus the pressure in, and what that, how that delta P evolves and changes by different rates of flow and pipe diameters. And, and this is really actually can be pretty important if you think about operations at Forge and we start designing these wells. So uh, let's take a little look at the pressure change with pipe diameter and mass flow. So the, I, want, I want to say before I begin though, so the, the pressure gradients were corrected for an initial thermal equilibrated uh, fluid in the well. So coming back here from our, our base, we, we actually just did a, a steady state where the bottom of the well was plugged and just filled all the way to the top of the water. We got the thermal um, signature in there and the pressure. And so that pressure was actually, as we started doing flowing situ uh, simulations, we subtracted that pressure out uh, to present this. So essentially the native state or the, the, the natural pressures there were, were taken out. So the only pressure change we're looking at are either result to the flow in the well or to the change in the density of the fluid, which and I'm not separating between those two because um, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to do than you might think. So what you see here uh, on, the, on the right hand side is the pressure change is the pressure change in megapascals uh, going from zero to 100 and the mass flow rate in kilograms per second going from zero to 160. Um, and these are your well diameters here starting with uh, 0.1 meter, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and 0.3, which correspond to four, six, eight, 10, and 12 inch diameter pipes. And what you'll notice here is that um, uh, not surprisingly enough is that most of the changes here um, are fairly small um, by pushing that fluid through the pipe. At the, the smallest pipe sizes, we, we get the highest amount of, of pressure change. And you'll see that actually, if you recognize that curve, it's like the, the flow has gone turbulent in the, uh, uh, in, in the four inch or the smallest diameter well. I didn't look at the, at the Reynolds number for this, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I need to pull that out. I suspect it, uh, uh, that the smallest pipe diameter we've gone turbulent. Um, the next pipe size down, we may be in the transition zone. And I think the other two are probably still laminar flow. But, uh, you know, for those of you, and, and I'm, I know some of you were cringing, um, so we're looking at this in, with uh, imperial units. So for that four inch case, our, our pressure change here uh, for the highest flow rate is approximately 12,000 PSI. Um, and that flow rate is give or take about 60 barrels per minute or 2,600 gallons a minute. Um, 
these things actually could be, you know, reasonably within a range for a geothermal well. Uh, some of our design characteristics, I mean, we need, uh, it, we could need as much as planned for 100 kilograms a second, uh, which could still put us, you know, somewhere here in this zone. So the size of the well could be very important. It also could be very important when we start planning um, stimulations where we may have a four inch or smaller um, the conductor pipe coming through there to, to run it and do our injections through as we pack some of these zones. So uh, important considerations that we're gonna look at uh, in more detail. Also, the, um, the outflow temperature. So thermal stimulation is something that, likes, that, that we can consider um, for, for, usually consider for longer term operations, but it's something that uh, is important when we start looking at the flow out of the well into the reservoir. Um, it's not surprising that the pipe diameter and flow rate have a significant effect on the injection temperature, the temperature that is leaving the well. So in all these simulations, um, what we did is actually the fluid being injected was pumped in at 60 um, degrees Celsius. And so that the bottom here essentially is T in and T out are these, these colored curves by the, um, the inside diameter of, of, the, of the pipe. So we're sitting here essentially at, at, you know, if we go with the slowest, lowest uh, injection rate of 20 kilograms per second um, and our largest pipe diameter of, of 0.3, we get about an 18 or so, uh, 19 degrees C temperature increase at pseudo steady state. So this would be the long-term injection temperature if we had that big of a well with that um, low of a flow rate. Now, of course, as our flow rates increase, our delta Ts or our Ts leaving the well converge, but you know, it's still, you know, the, the trend of smaller wells having a lower temperature because of lower surface area uh, persists all the way through. So we see this nice curve here, um, you know, but as I said, this is you know, pseudo steady state. I think we ran these simulations for about two years. Um, all, although the, uh, um, the things reached, you know, temporal evolution, only took very, very small amounts of time. So, but the temporal evolution of outflow is, is highly important. So shown here on the right is an example of uh, essentially now we're looking at time here in hours uh, on the right, or I'm uh, sorry, on the x-axis and the temperature in degree C. Now, so this is the 100 kilograms per section 100 kilograms per second injection case into the 0.2 uh, diameter well. Um, so the, the number of curves here is in this case T in um, is 60, as I said, but our T coming out, it takes about 30 minutes, a little over 30 minutes for to reach that near steady state outflow temperature, which is essentially eight degrees warmer um, for this case. Um, and the other, the orange line here is at the bend or the junction in the pipe, where you can see, of course, that temperature gets there a little sooner because it's about halfway through the system. Um, now these curves will shift one way or the other and, and, and their shape will get stretched out or condensed depending on the pipe diameter and the flow rate. Um, but importantly, as we start planning stimulations, whether we need to consider thermal effect for a, uh, you know, a 10 minute high rate in, um, uh, stimulation, um, these results may suggest that, you know, that just the pressure effects are all we really need to consider um, for, for some of our, our, our short duration uh, stimulations. But we'll look at these on a case, you know, on a very detailed basis um, based on the final well design uh, before we begin doing some of those things. Now, let's talk about coupling and data handoffs between THM and, and Falcon. So shown here essentially is, is an idealized thing. This is the tangent section of the well uh, as represented in, in THM. So as a user input, we put in the mass flow rate and the temperature at the very top. So and, and it, we, we would capture all that heat up and any pressure drop or pressure increase from density as we, as we move through here and come into this. Um, each place where we want to have perforations in the well, we, we essentially put what we call just a jump function um, in, in that essentially that well pipe. Um, shown here in gray would be the heat structure, the X symmetric heat structure, where um, THM essentially is, is doing conductive heat transfer from the reservoir into, through the pipe, into the fluid, uh, and vice versa um, going through there. So um, green on here is input from the user. Blue is essentially that's computed by Falcon and handed to um, THM. So the outside temperature of that heat structure that THM uses to calculate the interaction between the pipe and the reservoir, it, it pulls that from the Falcon simulation at that radial distance so that it, you know, it'll pull from the nearest nodes at that radial distance away from the well. 
Um, THM will compute a mass flow rate and a temperature of fluid leaving. So at, at all these junctions where the perforations will go, um, it actually will, it will calculate this um, and it will receive a pressure from Falcon here. So at all these things, we're, we're, we're essentially working for flow rate, temperature, and pressures at every place where there is a junction um, in the pipe. And how do we actually um, represent those perforation zones. Um, now, I, I work well, you know, with David Andrews, who is my co-author here. Um, he works in the physics of this area and and the uh, and, and and developed a lot of the code for THM. Um, and it's you know they, for for the pipe people, you know, these perforated zones are just leaks. Um, and so so you'll notice in a lot of my slides, I'll say leak zone one, leak zone two. Um, it's ingrained in their system. It flows losing, you know, going from a pipe. It's a leak. And it's a bad thing. Um, but we're we're working on that right now. To I'm trying to try and change those attitudes. But um, so in the bottom half of this image here, you see this steel tube wall. So essentially this is the, the, the well casing. And so we have a section here that has no perforations. We have a section that is perforated and we have a section again with no perforations. And how we represent that in THM, essentially you know, we have a 1D flow channel along the axis of the well, uh, a 0D junction, which is where we connect, connect other things. And again, a 1D flow channel. So in our previous, um, Example: This flow would be coming in on the on the right, flowing this direction, and essentially leaving here and leaving here. Um, so, the, but the junction where the perforations are essentially is another 1D flow channel. It's a smaller for for the for our base things I'm going to show today. It's just a smaller piece of pipe. And so, what we do is actually we take the sum of all the perforations that occur in this perforated zone, and and sum them up. Uh, to be a single flow channel or the leak. <clears throat> so essentially we have a small diameter pipe um, that extends some distance away from the well or away from the pipe. And so from there, we actually can calculate the pressure drops just as we did um, for the flow in the channel itself. So it's just a much smaller pipe. Now, I, I would say also that right now we're working on um, some more advanced um, ways to, to treat the, each the perforations and looking at essentially um, through a number, this is just one example, is looking at a limit entry formulation where we look at the pressure or drop through a perforation. Um, you know, we've been trolling the SPE literature and like to thank a number of, the, of my colleagues that have provided some recommendations. Um, um, uh, George King, Mark McClure, a few others who provided some really great literature on these things that we're working on those right now to treat each perforation separately. Um, you get the whole lot of, of very challenging numerics um, when you treat each perforation separately, whether we want to, um, as we're doing it now, we're actually just just still solving the Navier-Stokes equations for a small diameter pipe. It might get easier if we just do some um, functional relationship. We're still working on that. Get some really promising results so far, but I'm not quite ready to share them. Um, so what's some 3D examples and tests of the coupled uh, simulations? Um, the first is, you know, essentially there's two cases here, a simple and what we're calling a three stem um, uh, example. Uh, in both cases, they have the same uh, boundary conditions and initial conditions. They're only looking at thermal hydraulics. They're not looking at mechanics. We're looking at, looking at geochemistry. Um, the top of the model domain is 1800 meters depth. Um, and the temperature at the t or the temperature gradient is 70 degrees C per kilometer. Now the domain itself is subsampled from the native state model. It's um, 1400 meters or the, the Falcon domain uh, is 1400 meters by 600 meters by 1000 meters. And in all cases, we're going to inject uh, a total of 20 kilograms per second at 323K. And I, I apologize. Um, we, we work strictly in Kelvin in our codes, but so 50 degrees C. And we'll, um, we'll run these things for, for two years uh, just to take a look at how this functionality works. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to caution everyone before I start showing these results. Um, these are meant to be testing the code and the functionality. Um, they're not meant to be representative of anything that's happening at Forge yet, but we're preparing the tools for when we are ready to actually start doing this. So we'll have it ready to go and be, be, be satisfied with the functionality. So the simple scenario. Um, once again, so here's our model domain um, shown graphically um, along with the trajectory of 16A. Um, as I said earlier, there's three in injection zones, um, zone one, zone two, and zone three. Um, zone one being in the highest elevation in, in, the, uh, in the reservoir domain. Um, shown above here essentially is the initial uh, temperature distribution in the, in the grid spacing. So it's 25 meter spacing um, with that, size of the domain leads to about 55,000 cells. Um, we used uh, essentially a homogeneous anisotropic permeability of 10 to the minus 14 in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction is 10 to the minus 15. 
Um, and for the comparison here, so we actually used a point source or a couple THM simulations. So uh, for the point sources, we simply just divided that influx or the mass flow rate by three and, and just did a point source here at a fixed temperature of the uh, of that 60, 50 degrees C. Uh, with a couple THM, it actually was freed it to a portion flow, however the THM thought it should do at whatever temperature it should be. And for extraction, we put a line source, a line sink, 100 meters above the injection well. So some, the results here, um, and I would say that the, the, the simple scenario the, with just a, a uniform uh, porous media uh, was quite boring. Um, the high permeability kept the pressure changes modest. And in retrospect, so we, we, you know, these simulations were completed before the parametric study I showed earlier. Um, so choosing 20 kilograms per second um, in 16A and a, and a 0.2 meter um, didn't lead to much intra-pipe pressure losses. So basically it just handed things off quite well. Um, and we saw pretty much the same pressure distribution between the, the coupled run and the simple run. Um, we did see some differences. Um, so, uh, and the th few things to look at is that uh, the THM, the Navier-Stokes, required much smaller time steps than the Darcy formulation. So what I'm showing here is pressure from both models. So in the upper one is pressure that's coming from THM, and the lower is the pressure coming from Falcon. Now note they're on different time scales. So the time second or the, the time scale for the THM pressure is logarithmic in seconds. Um, and the, the Darcy or the, the Falcon code um, the time step is, the, is shown in days. Um, what you do see here is uh, the pressure for leak one or zone one, zone two and zone three. So the lowest pressure at highest in the reservoir and increasing pressure as you go deeper in the reservoir. Um, what's interesting here I want to point out is that um, you see this flat line in THM up to get to a thousand seconds. Well, the first time step um, for the Falcon code is a thousand seconds. So essentially this was working just by itself um, for a thousand seconds. And by nature of that Picard or that loose couple, um, once it gets some feedback between the two, the pressure jumped here. And that's essentially you're seeing some of this flow beginning to leave the well. And through the first 900 sec or 9,000 seconds or so, give or take, we, there was a little bit of things that happened early on. And after that, things got to be fairly smooth. What you're looking at here essentially is mostly just uh, um, most all of this going to the right. Um, I would also want to point out that I, the flow into that upper perforation zone by the nature of that high permeability, we were getting some boundary effects. At least that's my interpretation right now. Um, but the numerical performance of, of the coupled simulation was excellent. Convergence, time stepping, run times. Um, these were ran on, on my personal, actually on my Mac laptop. Um, and it didn't take very long to run these things at all. So we're pretty happy um, with that performance and, 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 the, and the results. Um, some of the outflow comparisons here between the two. Um, now I said a line sink was used. Essentially, what formulated it was a Piesman borehole formulation, and we put a point along that Piesman every 25 meters. So we try to catch something in, in every you know grid cell as it moved along, as it as it paralleled the injection well um, through here. At early times, but the nature of those Piesman boreholes, we just dropped the pressure uh, in that well for production uh, as a step function. So early time, we saw overproducing. Uh, we were producing, you know. 30 plus kilograms per second for short amounts of time. Um, then things equalized off. And we did see essentially the same behavior between the coupled and the standalone simulation. So the outflow mass flow rate was 19 and a half. We're losing a little bit in the boundaries, I believe. And um, the outflow temperature, interestingly enough, also was uh, matched pretty well between the, the coupled and the, and the standalone run. But you'll see we started producing at about 158 degrees C. And we did see a temperature decline of about six degrees C over that two year time period. Um, the strong agreement, I think, between the point source and THM, uh, it, it just kind of result of there's really very little reservoir dynamics and very little pressure buildup. Um, I think for really simple cases like this, um, you know, coupling to the, the THM uh, is probably overkill and uh, probably an adequate representation to use point sources, distribute how you want, um, or wherever be appropriate. Um, but let's get a look at something a little more, oh, oh one coupling issue. So. The one, the one is, as I recall back for the coupling, is that um, the THM was pulling temperature, you know, at the edge of that radial distance from Falcon, and then it actually THM calculates the temperature distribution along the well, which controls the heat flux into or out of the to the fluid inside the well from the outside reservoir. So, what you're looking at here is a plot of radial distance from the well increasing to the right, and temperature in, in Kelvin increasing upward. 
Um, so in areas here, say this red line, this temperature is what's computed by THM as it moves out um, into the radio distance away. At the very edge here is where it pulls temperature from Falcon. Um, and so what you're seeing here, essentially, this is just one point within the, uh, in the reservoir domain. The majority of the temperature gradient near the well is within the first, you know, in, a, in a few centimeters, essentially, is where your biggest gradients occur. Um, and then it moves out away. Um, one point here is in our perforation zone or our leak zones here is that fluid is leaving the well and it's not just conduction around the well bore and areas where we have leaks. So the, the issue comes in here is we need to think a little bit more about how we assign this, this edge here coming from Falcon and how it relates to the calculation in THM for the heat structure around the well itself. So what you're seeing here essentially is that those and so it's cooled here and and the the THM right here essentially is calculated some heat flow going to the right and some heat flow going to the left. Um, I hope you guys are hearing me okay. I just got a flash that my internet connection is unstable and I intentionally came to my office so I could do this without having these problems. But um, hopefully uh, everything's coming through okay. So anyway, we're, we're working on this issue right here um, to, to figure different ways to address this temperature gradient where flow should be. And, and if there is gradient from THM moving to the right or towards Falcon, it does not go into the Falcon. This is a one-way couple here. So it just takes from Falcon. It doesn't give temperature. Only place it gives temperature is from the fluid. Now, the interesting scenario, let's take a look at this. So the three stem scenario, um, essentially what we did was we take the same modeling domain, but we reduced the mesh size to a uniform 10 meters, which led to about 840, 850,000 um, grid cells. Um, it was heterogeneous anisotropic. So we upscaled a stimulated reference DFN to get a, a permeability tensor in the reservoir and porosity was upscaled from the fracture porosity. So, so here on the bottom right is what you're looking at essentially is a representation of the DFN, um, a snippet of the DFN the reference DFN um, that we're using for the forage reservoir with, with fracture sizes anywhere from 10 to 150 meters. These are colored by the size of the fractures themselves. And um, essentially the same three uh, injection zones, but in this case, a simple stimulation model was run at each of those things here. And it was stimulated pretty hard. So you can see what's shown here in blue are fractures that were in some way affected either by um, shear or by hydraulic fracturing. Uh, or some other um, here or dilation, and there so the permeability was increased, and in this subset of the DFN. And so what essentially what we did was we, um, I think I'll get to that my next one. The same line source, the same it, it was used 100 meters paralleling that production well. So um, the permeability range here, so essentially upscaled that stimulated permeability. Um, so those stimulated fractures were re-embedded into the native state or into the, the DFN and all that was upscaled to that 10 meter grid size where we essentially upscaled the permeability tensor and, and, the, and the process I said before. And that led to a permeability range of, of approximately 10 to the minus 14 um, to 10 to the minus 18 meters squared. Now, so the 10 to the minus 14 is, was, was that's how we picked the one for the, the simple case was that essentially that's the maximum that we had in, in the simple case. And 10 to the minus 18 is on or about the unstimulated, the natural state of the granite itself in the reservoir. Um, so that stimulation was carried out by, by Alita Fenella um, using Frackman. Um, and I want to scan what point out, this is a basic uh, thermal hydro simulation. Um, mechan no mechanical feedbacks, no precipitation dissolution. Um, the Velocity and permeability stayed constant through these two years. Um, but because of some of those, frac the, the grid size here actually shown above here is that fine 10, 10 meter uh, mesh size and just, just the same image without the mesh shown. Uh, and this is the porosity structure here, the upscale porosity structure. Um, is that because with some of those fractures, the simulated fractures were in the order of 100 meters. Um, so some of those fractures would cross cut as many as 10 to maybe even 15 grid cells in this upscaled model. So you'll see some of that structure comes through and becomes important later. Now the injection pressures and, and the distribution of flow. Now um, from the simple case, if you recall that the flow distribution in the three zones was fairly uniform and, and, and I would say uninteresting. Um, here with the highly heterogeneous system, what you're showing here is, is a slice 
through the model domain um, that goes right through the injection of the stimulator zones and also through the production well. So what you're seeing here colored is the, is the injection pressure. So we're seeing a much stronger pressure response in the reservoir. And what's shown here with these um, vectors, and they're, they're essentially sized and colored by the fluid velocity. Um, and essentially the takeaway from here is that um, we were actually perforation zone two took the majority of the flow and had the highest velocities. Um, and you can see pretty clearly the higher the injections here where the flow came in and these small areas where the, where the extraction borehole lowered the pressure or extracted the fluid. Excuse me. <laughs> so the flow pass through the fracture network became very interesting. Um, for this simple demonstration, uh, the stimulation zones didn't interfere with each other thermally. So, um, but you do recall, you know, we had a thousand meters here. We had three stimulation zones um, equally spaced away from the sides of the reservoir and between them. So they're, they're pretty far spaced. Um, uh, production well, uh, importantly, is also simulated as an open hole. So that essentially how that production well uh, will be actually designed in the, in the, for real in the Ford Reservoir um, is still up for debate. And, and you know, hopefully we we'll get some more insight on that from some of the external solicitations that are currently being evaluated. Um, the flow pass uh, between the perforation zones and production was, 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 was fairly tortuous. And it's shown here is a zoom in um, to that same image. So what you're seeing here on this plane here, this is essentially that same slice in pressure along the X axis of the domain. Uh, this is a slice along the Y through perforation zone two. And this is colored by the permeability distribution. So as I said earlier, some of those large through cutting fractures were with high permeability were actually represented in the magnitude of the permeabilities. And we're also showing here are some of the flow paths that as the fluid moved through, you know, through that fractured network between the injection well here in the center and the different points in the production well. And, and the one thing I just, I just, just realized right now is, is that, you know, these models, the simulations were all set up the same. And when I downsized the mesh here for 10 meters, the piecement borehole still has 25 meter spacing. So this might be a little bit different uh, if we put a point every 10 meters in, in that, uh, that piecement borehole. Uh, but for the purpose of this demonstration, um, it, it's still evident that we get, you know, pretty good flow along these flow paths and pretty good distribution um, of the fluid flow. So the pressure distribution, um, once again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, leak one, two, and three. So this is again, on the above is the pressure coming from the THM code for the well code and the bottom from, from Falcon. Now we're getting pressure increases that are, you know, more than a megapascal higher than the simple case, even with the same max permeability. And so if you recall from earlier that the pressure change from our initial, initial time step when Falcon first took its step was significantly smaller um, but here you're seeing quite a larger increase in flow, or I'm sorry, increase in pressure. And we're seeing a fairly uniform pressure rise across all three, I think largely because it, uh, it's tighter in and around those fracture domains for the most part. But as, as I said earlier, that perforation zone two took the majority of the flow, almost, well, almost half. So here's the, actually the flow that left the, um, the well. So this red line here is perforation zone two. The mass flow rate is approximately eight and a half kilograms per second. Now zones one and three, you know, took about five and a half and 6.4 kilograms per second respectively. Um, these things did stabilize and, you know, in, in, a, in a few months of, of simulation, they still change very slowly over time. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm really, really anticipating putting the, the mechanical and chemical permeability feedbacks into this case. Um, but and, and um, in this case, I wanted to point out too that all the perforations on all three uh, were submitted to having the same amount of, of shots of the perf. So it was 60 degree um, uh, spacings, 10 shot or six shots per foot, 60 degree spacing, and 10 feet of perforation. So there's essentially what 60 perforations. Each perforation was three eighths inch diameter, and those were summed up to, um, for that the, the for the leak calculation. Thermal performance was, was really surprising to look at this. So um, the mass outflow, we didn't get that same spike from the Peaceman borehole at early time because a lot of that borehole was actually in really low permeability materials. Um, we saw a lot slower evolution for the flow outflow to come to near steady state, but we see similar response between a, a standalone and the coupled, um, where the, the, the coupled THM run had a little bit less outflow. Uh, I still think we have some, some boundary effects here 
to some degree, you may have noticed that in some of the pressure distribution plots I showed. Um, but the three-step case had a whole lot better thermal recovery than the simple case. So on the bottom here is the outflowing temperature. And you can see that we, you know, in the simple case, we started at about 158 degrees C, but you know, we, we ended up down at about 152 give or take after two years. And in this case, because I think the larger the torture washing, the flow pass and some of that flow moving around there, we actually end up with a, a fairly more uniform uh, production temperature over a longer period of time. Now that, that essentially gets to where we're at today. So this is a work in progress. Um, you know, I'm happy to, 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 to we're gonna keep working on it over the next few months. Um, so the things we're actually still actively working on right now is revising the THM temperature feedback to get a better distribution coming from Falcon and working on the, the limited entry perforation formulations. Um, and we will actually build some of those formulations and test options to see, even given that we have a higher permeability distribution around um, the, uh, the perforation zone two or stimulation two in the middle, if we could change the, uh, the perforation completion of the well to essentially limit or get more uniform flow coming out of the well. That's one of our goals is to essentially have a well distributed flow in, in the system. Um, and, and later, as, as we're gonna actually begin full well scale, long-term operational modeling with all the mechanical and chemical feedbacks, that's still a little bit ways out. I mean, we're still working on our base stimulation plans. And I think that might be the talk of our next uh, uh, forum will be uh, kind of the status of the stimulation planning and stimulation modeling. Um, that actually ends up, that closes out all the things I want to cover today. Um, let me put this back up here, but I'm gonna look and see um, if we had uh, any questions come in and I could pull those things up. Okay, so question, um, only two questions here. Does the project anticipate you ever using friction reducers, slick water? Um, there is an active, um, another task active in developing a stimulation plan. And we are looking at, um, yes, so I guess the short answer is yes, friction reducers may be used. We're also looking at gels, we're looking at propens, we're looking at a whole number of things um, in ways to actually do the stimulation of the reservoir. Um, and, the next question, how do you validate your numerical models? I think that's pretty, um, I think I need more details on what part of validating, what part of what model it's like to know. So the, um, okay, so, um, I'm reading through the questions here. The, um, So the first one, have you validated well bore reservoir simulators against something as STARS? No, I don't have access to STARS. Um, both of the other, both of the codes here that you've seen are fully validated. So the, the as I said earlier, the uh, the THM and the relap code is, is actually validated to the NQ1, NQ, NQA1 certification level. So it's it's certified to do, you know do the work for designing nuclear reactors. So it's it's fully validated. Um, there was a code comparison activity for all the reservoir simulators that GTO sponsored a number of years ago, um, and Falcon was actually compared against all the codes there and and, and performed gave similar results for most problems. Um, the coupling here between the you know the intra well between the two is more of a function of the um, uh, of the connecting between the two. So that's something we can, we can look at a little bit more detail. Um, hopefully that answers your question there. Um, okay, something here doesn't really need answered. Um, so a question about reactor transport. Um, so um, the, uh, so the question is, you mentioned that Falcon simulates reaction diffusion. Does it do reactive transport? Yes, it does reactive transport as in infection, dispersion, diffusion, sourcing, terminal. Yes. So basically it, it could do it essentially a standard geochemistry um, type simulation, reactive geochemistry, uh, as you would from any other kind of say for like geochemist workbench or a tough react, things of those kind of natures. It, it's the same kind of a formulation as those things. So um, and it, it's, we're working right now is the best way to do the coupling for that, whether we're doing the global implicit. The, the problem with you doing too many things, uh, I, I anticipated somebody's question, is coupling the chemistry and coupling the pressure is, is what is the best way to do it. So if you have two different physics changing what could be changing the permeability, either say by pore elasticity and also by chem or by dissolution precipitation we are working through that right now as the you know, as the ways to look at how that coupling goes right now. So right now, you know, the C is a little bit 
Uh, we're, we're working the best way to do that numerically. I suspect it may be pulled off and be either loosely or strongly coupled, but it might be a separate solve. Um, just because of the, it's hard enough just doing mechanical. So the, the mechanical part, we actually do fully coupled with the global implicit scheme to get those feedbacks. But uh, convergence can be a real challenge, I'm sure, as anyone who does the, uh, um, uh, does these kind of code development simulations would know, uh, because it's, it's highly sensitive, highly nonlinear PDEs in here. So we're working on that one. And the questions are coming in really fast. I'm trying to, I'm just going to kind of keep going with them. I can, it is uh, noon. I could stay on as long as we want. So, um, so the, the question there is uh, specifying fracture permeability parameters. Th that's a topic for another presentation. Um, for what we just showed here, it, it, it was just, um, just kind of crude, well, I don't want to say crude, yeah, it was just a very simple stimulation model. It, it wasn't meant to be illustrative of the true physics or what we expect to see. So, um, but stay with us on that one because that uh, will be something we'll be looking at here. There's, there's an active subgroup uh, working on that right now. So it's really good. Um, so, okay, next question. Any plans to look at oil field flow control methods for injection production, inflow, outflow control, um, fixed or adjustable control? Uh, so that is, yes. Um, so we're looking at that right now. And that's actually, there, there's an open solicitation uh, as part of the FORGE program right now that um, applications are being evaluated for zonal isolation, for flow control devices and these things. So the, um, uh, uh, yes, what they are, what they're going to be, we don't know. Um, but, you know, we're, we're trying to work and look to evaluate and have the tool, the numerical tool to evaluate these things and be able to come up with some, um, the, uh, um, uh, some ways to actually give some information to help elucidate this behavior. Some of what we won't know in, in, until we uh, and go and do that. So, um, if you want to run logs or equip your wells with DTS or other downhole sensors or gauges that would allow value? Yes. Um, so in some of these things, so a lot of our monitoring wells have DTS um, either embedded or DTS and DAS cables embedded in. So it's a little bit more challenging um, in the injection and production wells. So the, the, the logs, well, yes. So the wells will all be rigorously logged um, when they're developed and, and intermittently, you know, as, 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 they're, as they're tested. So, but um, whether it'll be a DTS cable and all these things, um, is still yet so some of those things if they're inside the casing it can still happen outside the casing because we're gonna, there's not gonna be a whole lot outside the casing as i believe the current design is right now um i could be wrong i'm not leading that work but uh, uh in the tangent section i don't expect to see much optics or many sensors outside in the cement simply because we don't know where we're going to be doing the perforations yet and the risk for destroying that stuff as we run our perf guns um uh Moving on here. Do you ever use commercial software for modeling? Systems? Yes. Uh, um, we use Abacus. We use um, a number like the, the reservoir. You know, so we have a number of, of, of commercial codes that we use for these things that we, we have evaluated. Um, so Abacus is one. You know, a lot of our mechanics folks here um, are, have used Abacus. I would say that the capabilities in the, our tensor mechanic modules probably ex seed those of abacus um but i, I don't want to i don't want to launch a fight there for that but um I, I don't think we're missing anything um by using our own um next question here sort of wasn't clear uh, so somebody's predicting frictional pressure drop in the well bore during flow friction frictional reducer was used yeah of course um so the question is whether you know if you use friction reducers in the well yeah of course all that you know it, it would change it with the pressure distribution of friction we like in the well um it, it, that's simple. So that basically, um, it was calculated. It's all essentially. There's no real work to do to change that. So if I have an equation to state for the fluid, or I can put something in for what those um, viscosity, density, other fluid properties would be, um, all the the friction, all these things, essentially, all the friction is all essentially handled by looking at either uh, Newslet numbers, Prandtl numbers, Rayleigh numbers, Reynolds numbers. Um, so that is actually calculated, you know, spatially distant. So the frictional, the friction in that pipe is 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 a function. It's a spatial. It's a calculated quantity. It's not a it's not a specified quantity. It's a calculated quantity. Um, um, regards to wellbore thermal hydraulics and models, have you used commercial software such as Halliburton Landmark? Um, no, 
we, we do have access to the Schlumberger suite of codes. So we've used a, a lot of those codes for one part or another. Um, but the, the, the problem here comes in is, is the, uh, you know, essentially is, is the transparency and open nature. So basically, you know, we're making it so all the work that we do as a Utah Forge team, um, all of our work, essentially the input data, uh, boundary conditions, initial conditions, everything is open source, handed off, and the code is too. Um, so there's full, complete transparency to the whole system. And the coupling, you know, so th th that's one of the limitations of trying to piece codes together, trying to use something like a commercial code for one part of the well and another code for this and that and, and time all together is uh, our choice w was to have everything essentially kind of work together in an open source framework. And we have a lot more control over what are losses we might have via the handoffs. The questions are slowing down. Um, I'm happy to keep taking them. and. Um, if there's other recommendations here, the uh, um, happy to you know email those along or type them in here. Um, we'll take them. So this is all you know. Once again, I think I've mentioned this to a number of people. This is a community-driven effort. Um, we're happy to take uh, any help we can get. Any you know, questions, comments, um, and I get snide remarks. I'll take those too, as long as they're be constructive. So I'll leave the slides up here for another minute or two. If we have other questions that come in. Um, happy to hang on the line but if, if we're done here thank you all for your time today um, if you have recommendations or requests for future um, forums please send them along too you can either put them in this chat or email them to this so um, I don't have a confirmation of our next one will be yet but I'm thinking it's probably going to be on the on the, uh, the stimulation planning and, and the preliminary stimulation models thanks everyone Um, so the question about uh, how to come up with the DFN for the simulation shown, um, you're about three, um, I'd, re I'd recommend you go into the, um, on the Utah Forge webpage for, and for the forum. And I think two forums ago, Alita Finella from Golder gave a forum on how we come up with the DFNs. So basically, you know, we have a number of, um, of detailed uh, well logs um, and, and also the, um, fracture mapping at the surface. And so the combination of those two things were used to develop some DFNs and, uh, uh, and, and propagate them throughout the model domain. Uh, a lot of work's been done into it and, and those DFNs are available. A um, number of them are shared or if you needed something special, we, we usually will prepare a DFN, at least give you the statistics if you wanna do that or specific realization, we'll give those to you as well. Uh, the question about overlap with thermal recovery applications in Western Canada. Um, T. Um, uh, Zakasi, Z uh, Zahashi, um, so drop me an e email. Um, I'm happy to discuss what you're doing here. First, maybe we can collaborate. Uh, sounds interesting. Um, as a whole separate uh, um, effort here, we're doing some a lot of thermal storage and thermal recovery work um, that may be of interest. Ah, good. Okay, more more questions. I could talk about this stuff all day. So, um, next question. Um, could you identify the most challenging technical problem for making EGS work? Go, oh, good grief, um, Luke. I, I'm not. I'm going to kick you in the butt for that one. Um, so, uh, for me, this is Pedgorny speaking. This is not Forge. This is not DOE. This is not anything. This is Pedgorny. Um, what we, you know, what I look at the most is essentially getting uniform heat sweep, sustainable recovery, and not having and, and limiting the potential for unwanted seismicity. And I think um, well control is the way to do that. So um, looking at the limit entry, look at other kind of potential designs to control how much flow leaves the well where, I think is key to that to keep our, our, our perturbed part of, this, of the subsurface to the very minimum. That's where I'm coming from that. So um, uh, next question here. Um, does your wellbore thermal model include heat transfer mechanisms such as natural convection and radiation behind uncemented casing? We've looked at the heat transfer between uh, nearby oil wells. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, the well model, um, uh, the, um, so what we look at here, so yeah, so we could look at natural, so I'm not, I'm wondering if you mean natural convection outside the casing, so flow, fluid flow moving across the well. 
um, and actually changing heat recovery from that is we yes that can be done that's not something that we're considering as a, a critical consideration for forge simply because the the, the natural conditions of the test uh, of that granite essentially has a permeability of 10 to minus 18 um, meters squared which says it's 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 yeah, yeah, it, there, there isn't really much natural convection there but so within the well itself we can actually look at natural convection um, within the well so if a well is sitting there stagnant we can have buoyancy driven flow or density driven flow within the well itself or in the pipe um, and the heat transfer mechanisms um, that, that actually they're calculated automatically by looking at the nooselet number and if we uh, look at do we get near um, turbulent flow we use a different thermal you know essentially the uh, tra transfer coefficient along the surface uh, depending on what the conditions that whether it's laminar or turbulent flow in the well so if you have unsmented annulus and you, that could be done um, it, um, that that would just a matter of removing the cement and having it filled with fluid um, I, I don't sus well that, that could have some pretty profound effects but uh, um, I'm just thinking um, it's something we could look at, but I, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a top tier level concern here um, for, for, the, for the case in Forge. Um, for, you know, if people want to use a single well or loops and things like that, it may become important um, to increase the heat transfer area. I hope that answers your question, Albert. Our questions are fading and our attendees are fading as well. I'm still happy to stay on. Uh, I, I see a few names here I recognize. So if there's any other questions or comments, um, please send them my way. Uh, Peter, I see that you're on. Thanks for attending. Hope you're feeling better um, and you're, you're, you're getting back on the mend. Our questions have stopped. I'm gonna close it here and um, thank everyone for your attendance and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay healthy and stay safe. Bye now.